Welcome to Ring of Fire. I'm Mike Papantonio. Pundits are trying to push the Democratic Party further and further to the right, and we'll tell you why it's so hard to indict a police officer in America. We'll also explain how employers are stealing wages from their employees. It's going on every day. We have all that and more coming up, but right now, remember, you just stepped in to the Ring of Fire. You can't change Washington from the inside. You can only change it from the outside. Grand jury secrecy rules. For political gain. The press can find out. That has nothing to do with politics, but go ahead. It wouldn't bother me. Oops. <laughs> Historically, after electoral losses, the pundit class tries to push the Democratic Party even further to the right. But the American public doesn't want a more centrist Democratic Party, and the midterm victories of progressive policies show that. Joining me now to talk about this is best-selling author Thomas Frank. Thomas, uh, your latest phony spin, even from Fox News, uh, they can't buy it. <laughs> and that phony spin is that Democrats need to keep moving further and further to the right, that if they'll simply move to the right, all is going to be well. Uh, how, how many times must we go through this, and where did it all start? Well, I, I don't, yeah, you know, and, and they do this after every election. You know that. It's, uh, I mean, I'm a, uh, I'm of a certain age, and I remember it after, well, every election of my adult life, every election since I started voting anyway, every time a Democrat loses, it is attributed to their liberalism. Every time a Democrat wins, it's because they very wisely moved to the center. And this is always the explanation. You know, there's, there's never any – nothing deeper than that is allowed. Well, e even though – even when you look at it, and you've done such a great job kind of laying this out in, 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 in explaining, for example, uh, you know, knee-jerk, you may think, well, um, you know, Walter Mondale, well, he, he certainly was way, way liberal. But if you take a look at what Mondale was about, he was very much on board of the centrist idea. He was – probably moving more to the center. And when he lost, as you pointed out, in the presidency run in 1984, of course, the talking points are, well, gee whiz, he was too liberal. We see that, yeah, That's repeated yeah, well, itself over and over, hasn't it? Well, that's right. He was, he, he was a liberal. He's very famously a, 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 a liberal. But in order to run for president, he, he swung way to the right. right. Uh, he, he did exactly what the pundits and the political scientists tell you to do. And uh, and then when he lost, <laughs> they blamed it on his liberalism. If people don't remember this, but uh, what Walter Mondale ran on was in, in 1984. Remember, Reagan had run up a f the federal deficit. Sure. You remember this? The federal deficit, you know, as we now know, this is sort of the Republican game plan. But Reagan ran up the federal deficit with this sort of gigantic explosion of military spending. And Mondale promised to uh, bring it back down by, among other things, raising taxes. He was going to be very responsible. He basically promised austerity, you know, and this is something that, <laughs> that nobody, nobody wants. Well, of course, uh, a student of all this certainly has been have been the Clintons. I mean, Bill Clinton took what had come before him, said, gee whiz, let me ship all the jobs overseas by giving us something called NAFTA. Let me then let me let me let me invent trade agreements that are going to kill the economy, but are going to make Republicans a lot of money. And the Republicans loved him for it, didn't they? they yes. Now, Clinton is a really interesting case because the uh, the people, the, the kind of pundits here in Washington who 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 talk endlessly about this, the need to move to the center for elections, you know, they always point to Bill Clinton as their example. He is the perfect example, the centrist who got reelected. What they very conveniently forget is is the message that Bill Clinton was uh, was using in 1992, and I've written about this a number of times for Salon because it's so astonishing to think about it. One of his big issues was inequality, okay, which we now think of as like, you know, it's out of control in, our, in this day and age, but Bill Clinton was talking about it all the time on the stump in 1992. In 1994, he had, what had he done in office? Well, among other things, he had failed to get health care passed, and he had passed NAFTA, and NAFTA, of course, is that you know this huge insult to his base, and has driven essentially driven white working class voters away from Democrats ever since. And uh, the Republicans very, very naturally made this enormous comeback. Then, but it's not because uh, I mean they didn't they didn't uh, win because Bill Clinton had been revealed as this extreme 
liberal. It was exactly the opposite. Well, one, one yet, thing we saw, yet, Thomas, right? one thing we saw with Bill Clinton when he was talking about this disparity and the idea of, of we just need to even things up for everybody. His idea was, well, the, the, the stronger bond uh, that I can make with Wall Street as president then it's going to enable me to do all of those things. And that love affair, I mean, in the truest sense to me, and you may disagree, uh, you're certainly a better historian than I am, but I, I, I think if I were to take a look at where the Democrats made that bond in blood, it was Bill Clinton. And as you say, everybody uses that as the poster board for what every Democrat must look like, even though it has continued to kill, to, to basically batter, batter the Democrats ever yeah. since Bill Clinton. Well, it's the kiss of death. You know, it's the kiss of death, and you can. It's a kiss of death in two different ways. One is, you know, for Democrats themselves. Okay, and people say, yeah, but Bill Clinton's so successful. I don't know if you remember this, but before he was president, they'd had control of, of Congress ever since the 30s. Yes. With a with a few brief exceptions. That's like that could never happen now. Yes. I mean, they've you know the other thing is. You know whether it's good for Democrats or not. It's terrible, terrible, terrible policy. NAFTA, bank deregulation, these are awful things. They've done awful things to our country. And you know, I don't. At the end of the day, I don't really care about the politics of it. I care about the people. I care about what it's done to us. And it's a Democrat that did it. Well, the the movement that we're talking about. Let's be more specific. The movement that we're talking about towards the centrist position, of course, is t entitlements always have to be cut. And certainly we yeah, saw right, Bill Clinton. Right, the second thing is we, the, we've got way, here, I, we've I'm got here a, in Washington. Yeah, we've got it. We've got a deficit. That the second thing is we got a deficit. Deficit. We got to get it under control, even though we know that that the history tells us that's ridiculous. And then the third thing is we have to create trade deals with the rest of the world that's going to generate this new business for the American economy, which we've seen the result of that as we have no industry left in this country. I so, but, th but those, that, those are the core as I see them. Thomas, would you add anything to that? Well, that's pretty much got it. But, but what you're talking about here is the conventional wisdom in D.C. And what, what look, at the, at, the, at the sort of at the bottom of uh, this story is this kind of colossal political opportunism where people take – this sort of, uh, you know, th this political position that everyone in D.C. agrees on, what, what you just said, free trade agreements, you've got to get, get entitlements under control, you've got to get after, go after the federal deficit, things that the rest of the country really dislikes. And, and the people, the pundits here in D.C. present these things as being the center, the center. And as everyone knows who took political science 101, the center is, where, is how you win every election. And so it, what, what's amazing to me is that the number of politicians that have fallen for this, because these are profoundly unpopular positions. All three of the th things that you, that you just described and that I that we we talked about the D, you know the DC pundits all agreeing are profoundly unpopular, and yet they have convinced themselves that these are the only mm. way you can win elections. Mm. It's a you know it is it is it's I would say it's fascinating to me, but it's more kind of horrifying. Mm. Uh, and this just goes on and on and on, you know. Thomas, I see uh, we we see we see Hillary out there. Let's let's use her as, of, of of Exhibit A right now. Okay, here she is. It's almost like she's gotten permission from from the the centrist to write Wall Street to every now and then start talking a little bit of populism, even though yeah. we know that it's 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 an absurd notion that she is a populist. But what, what does that tell you about what the Democratic Party is experiencing now to where you have what they consider broadly their front runner that's almost talking uh, a little schizophrenic? You know, we know we know she's owned and operated by Wall Street. I, I, you don't have to say that. Let me say that. But that's my that's my observation. So now we have her owned and operated by Wall Street, but she's out there every now and then. Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders seems to push her, or Sherrod Brown seems to push her to, to start talking like a populist. What do you yeah, make of well, that? Well, look, that she has, uh, she's actually, you know, uh, uh, smarter than a lot of the other people we're talking about, and has looked at the 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 polls and has looked at what's happening in this country and realizes that uh, populism actually is is what makes the sale i mean time and time again now that look that doesn't mean uh that uh, that she's going to govern that way you, you know that but right we saw obama, I mean, <laughs> didn't, didn't we see obama <laughs> yeah, do obama, the same thing same I mean, deal. It, bill clinton same deal yeah these people all do this this is they 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 run 
and they're very concerned about uh, about what's happening to uh, small towns and uh, and you know and farmers and and they and they win the election and then you know look this is what it, it, I'm talking about. Uh, pundits here and the way pundits delude themselves and to a certain degree the way democratic candidates you know uh, also delude themselves but the democrats uh they it's kind of a uh, you know a, a dark dirty secret for these people they know that the, the only way a democrat can get elected is by uh is by playing the populist card but i mean look at what obama did to mitt romney i mean <laughs> i mean mitt romney you know it was a complete setup there was no other way to go after the guy but obama did a uh, a Really masterful job taking him apart. You know, we're running this this very populist campaign. It doesn't mean Obama's going to govern as a populist. He's, I mean, he's the opposite. We've seen the result of that. Look, Thomas, I always describe you as a little bit Howard Zinn, a little bit Studs Terkel. I'm just grateful that you're out those are there. Two great, those are two great men. They Studs are very great. They're, 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 they're two of my a favorite friend people. Of mine. And, and I'm glad that you're out there uh, keeping us up on stories like this. Please feel free to come back anytime. Thank you, Thomas. Oh, absolutely. Thomas Frank is a contributor to Salon.com and the best-selling author of Pity the Billionaire. Not only are American corporations pulling in higher profits than ever, they're currently receiving more federal tax subsidies and tax breaks than any other time in history. On top of that, they're getting billions every year in new tax breaks. So now many corporations are paying their CEO more than they pay Uncle Sam. Joining me now to talk about that is Howard Nations. Howard, it just seems like uh, the Congress just can't give enough away. They can't give enough welfare away to multinational corporations and at the same time deprive the average worker of every damn thing they can. I, I, it's, it is so upside down for, for, for this not to be talked about every night on the news is just beyond me. Uh, talk, talk about what the Institute for Policy uh, Studies had to say about this. It's a startling, it's a startling report. Well, it's, it points out some very big lies that have been repeated so often that they've now been believed by the American public. Let's begin with the fact that of seven of the 30 largest American corporations who were highly profitable in 2013 earned $74 billion in profits. They $74 paid billion. $74 billion, billion correct. Uh -huh. They paid no taxes, but it gets worse than that. They actually received $1.9 billion in refunds. Now get that straight. They paid no taxes. They made $74 billion in profits. They paid no taxes, but they received $1.9 billion in refunds. So their net effective tax rate was a negative 2.5%. How do you receive a 1.9 billion in refunds if you pay no taxes? Government well, uh, you know, Howard, subsidies. To me, to, me, to me, even more incredible, look at what they paid their CEOs. I mean, oh, yeah. the same corporations. Tell, tell the viewers how that works. Okay, they make, they make billions. They, they pay no taxes. Uh, when the average American is barely trying to get by and pays every cent of his taxes, talk about what they do for their CEOs. Well, they're distributing funds to their CEOs instead of paying taxes. They distribute funds to the CEOs and the shareholders uh, as dividends. The CEOs uh, pay of those seven average $17.5 million a year uh, on that $74 billion, uh, $74 billion in profits. But if you look at the 100 highest paid CEOs in America in 2013, 29 of those received more money than the corporation paid in taxes to the government. In other words, they paid their CEO more than they paid the government in taxes. 29%, 29 of those received an average of $32 million uh, last year in salary. In corporations that reported $24 billion in profits, they paid no corporate taxes. They also received $238 million in subsidies after paying no taxes, so their net effective tax rate was 1%. Twelve CEOs of the companies that reported U.S. losses, their CEOs averaged $36.6 million in income. Oh, well, okay, let's, let's back up and tell it really how, I mean, 
<laughs> this is such an ugly story. Will you tell me how many times you've heard this on mainstream media? I, how about how about zero? How about zero? Because some of those some of those big bonuses are paid to people running corporate media. Okay, but okay, here's what is really bothersome. I think when most people understand this, uh, sit, let's take Citigroup. That's the company that received the largest tax refund in America. Now, this is a company that taxpayers had to bill, that we had to bail them out to, to billions of dollars that we, they were so damn corrupt, so criminal, so incompetent that taxpayers had to bail them out. Okay, after we bail them out in 2013, they, they pay their CEO $18 million and they get a refund for $260 million. Now, is that typical of what we're seeing? What other companies? What other companies should we be looking at here that are doing the same kind of ridiculous scam to the taxpayers? Well, across the board, in your top in your top 500, uh, you can look look at the S and P 500. You can look at the top 100. It's the major corporations, and what they're doing. What you're hearing is the theory that they have to uh, they they have to uh, give these big refunds to the corporations because if they don't, they leave America and they go overseas. You, they argue that the corporate tax rate is the highest in the world uh, when in fact they, they claim it's 35 percent when in fact uh, the average actual average payment is 19.4 uh, percent, which is less than what most uh, small businesses pay. And the fact is right now, Taxes as a share of gross domestic product are near an all-time low, and corporate profits are at an all-time high. And you hear this big lie about how corporations are the job creators. The fact is there are 9 million unemployed and 3 million been unemployed for more than six, than six months. At the same time, corporations are not putting money back into uh, the business and creating profits. What they're doing, they're not hiring workers. They are repurchasing their own stock. They took the money from the bailout that they were supposed to put into hiring new workers and creating new business. What they did was they're hiring, they're, they're not hiring workers, they're repurchasing their stock, they're buying out their competitors, they're merging, uh, which all of which reduces unemployment. Well, uh, let, let me stop you. Let me stop you right there. Okay, let's talk about the merger, the acquisitions. That is something the CEO does because right. most of the time it's going to raise stock value. Right. And if you raise stock value, the CEO gets to say, "Well, you need to pay me more." So it's right. driven by these damn insider Wall Street MBAs. There's a small group of them. I mean, they 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 move from company to company. About a hundred of them that move from company to company pulling off these scams. And one is, hell with the workers. Thank you, taxpayers, for bailing us out to the tune of trillions of dollars. We'll take the money. We won't put it back into the, into the working world. We won't hire people. Trickle down is complete, utter nonsense. Instead, we're going to engage in acquisitions, and we're going to raise our, our, uh, our value. Therefore, they're going to pay us more. Howard, here's the number I saw. Right now, 80%, 80% of all the tax breaks that Congress is talking about, right. they're talking about going to the largest corporations in America. Did I get that right? You have that right. And what you see now is a redistribution of wealth. They're talking about redistribution of wealth and criticizing Obama's redistribution. There is a redistribution of wealth because there, there are two theories, and, and you really need to understand this so you know the lies when you hear them. The, the theories are retain and reinvest. Corporations followed the theories of retaining and reinvesting from, from World War II through the 1970s. And what does that mean? Re what is, explain well, that. Well, it means that they, they retain, when, when they get their earnings, they take their earnings, they retain their earnings, and they reinvest their, their earnings back into their business, mm -hmm, which it. allows them to create more products, hire more workers, so the money flows right back into the economy. That's the re retain and reinvest. That's what you hear. This is the argument that's still used, especially by Republicans. We have to give this money back to the corporations. They're the job creators. That, that's the theory of job creation. 
But the fact of the matter is, since Reagan, shift, they shifted to downsize and distribute, which, uh, and are, the, the Congress still argues that re retain and reinvest is, is what's going on. That, that's been a lie for 40 years. It's a big lie to justify their pandering to corporations. The fact is, uh, since from 2003 to 2012, the S&P 500 used 54 percent of their earnings to buy back their own stock. When you buy back your own stock, they also paid 37 percent of their earnings to pay dividends. When you repurchase your own stock, you boost your earnings per share, which in turn boosts your, your stock prices and your stock prices and your earnings is what determines the CEO. Yeah, and income. so in the end, I mean, the, the, the shorthand is in the end, uh, you have Congress giving out subsidies, permanent, permanent subsidies to people who own NASCAR track, NASCAR yeah, car yeah. racing tracks. They get a subsidy. Yeah. The people who own Puerto Rican rum producing, they get a subsidy from the U.S. government. Permanent tax breaks. And the average person out there sometimes is trying to figure out how in the hell they even pay their mortgage. How do they feed their family? And we're worried about what the CEOs of America's largest, the world's largest corporations are making because we're, we're, we're telling everybody, listen, Give these guys more money, and they're going to share it with you. And we know, don't we, that is an absolute, total lie. Howard Nations, as usual, thank you for bringing the story. I defy anybody to find this being reported anywhere else in corporate Absolutely. media. You will yeah. not find it. Try to go online and try to find another media reporting this story. Thank you for joining me, Howard. My pleasure, Mike. Thanks. Ferguson, Missouri has become a microcosm of the racial tension in America today, and the result of Darren Wilson's grand jury investigation has made things much worse by highlighting injustice that exists in the African-American community. Joining me to talk about this is blogger Chauncey DeVega. Chauncey, you did what we're all, the, the media should do, and that's to actually read what, what, what Darren Wilson had to say in his report. Um, unfortunately, most people didn't do that. Most people didn't actually pay much attention to what he actually said because it tells us an awful lot. Uh, as you talk about this, how about broadening it? And let's talk about in general, do these facts sound like what we usually see when a police officer commits homicide? I mean, isn't this just a, bl a blueprint? Uh, take it from your, from your reading of this. Darren Wilson was either possessed of a fever dream of white racism when he wrote and gave his testimony to the grand jury, or he was coached by his attorneys to come up with such an unfathomably outrageous version of events that would be better suited for a remake of Birth of the Nation at a summer stock theater by the KKK or by neo-Nazis. <laughs> it is. If you actually sit down and read what he wrote, here is just some samples, instead of what the drive-by media has offered from folks who've actually sat down and read Darren Wilson's testimony. He described Michael Brown as a giant Negro. And this is very, very important. He said giant Brown, uh, that Michael Brown was so large and so strong that when he grabbed him, he felt like he was being held by Hulk Hogan and he was reduced to a five-year-old. He said that Michael Brown had the ability to duck down his head and run through bullets while making feral grunting noises. Apparently, Michael Brown also talks like a black exploitation actor from a bad movie in the 70s because he apparently beats Darren Wilson, who interestingly enough, if you look at the video, has no injuries to his face. He looks like he just got up, went out, uh, got up, woke up, and went out. No visible injuries, but apparently this monstrous giant Michael Brown hits him with so, so much force that he's in, uh, afraid for his life. And the more general context is, as I said, we have two options here. Either Darren Wilson actually believes these profoundly racist things, we would call this implicit bias, he was coached to say these ridiculous things, which is very likely, or some combination of the two. We know that justice is Yeah, isn't okay, well, let, let me stop you right there, because that's a, that's a lot of material. Here, here's where I see this. You've reported on these types of incidents before. Let's, let's take what we just talked about, and let's broaden it to the police community in general. We know that, that, we know that what has to happen is the police officer has to somehow give the impression 
that, that they were concerned about their life or the lives of others. Plug in the, uh, because we see that virtually in every report that surfaces like this, that usually surfaces weeks after the homicide. In other, in other words, it takes place, they look at the forensic evidence, they try to make the story fit the forensic evidence. So let's take that one part that uh, with with the with the Wilson testimony that says, "Gee, I was objectively very very concerned for my own life and the life of others." Talk about that. Well, what happens here is, as you smartly pointed out, you change your narrative to try to fit made up facts in order to find yourself uh, in a position where you'll be exonerated. So it's very very difficult for police in any case to ever be found guilty of committing murder of uh, any sort of impropriety, especially when it's against a person of color. But what uh, Darren Wilson did and his attorneys counseled him to do is come up with this exaggerated and bizarre story of a crazed black teenager who apparently attacks police officers. Any black or brown person knows never to attack a police officer, never mind talk back to them. Then you can create this exaggerated sense of fear. And what he did was he played on these deep uh, anxieties that a lot of our white brothers and sisters, we have a lot of research about this, have about African Americans and to a lesser degree Latinos. So Darren Wilson was able to exaggerate this story that's deeply rooted an anti-black bias in this country that goes back hundreds of years. So the jurors, so the jurors would then say, "My God, how could anybody not be afraid of this crazy, feral, uh, super strong, superhuman black person who attacks police?" And then that also allows them to then cover up the facts as we've seen. This grand jury process, number one, was unprecedented in terms of it was an info dump to uh, confuse the jurors. And then by dumping all this information, the prosecutor is then able to say, "Look." We have all these other witnesses who then say that Darren Wilson is innocent, including the infamous juror number 40, who is a confessed white supremacist. In the main okay, now, now let me stop you right here. First of all, those facts, again, I want I to broaden this discussion. If we take those facts and we compare them to what you have seen if you've, as you've covered stories like this throughout the country, anytime you see, uh, uh, anytime you see an incident of this, does this not sound exactly like the facts that might that we might see in Topeka or that we might see in New York or that we might see in Ocala, Florida, where police officers step by step methodically create this narrative that gets them past the threshold, which is this this subjective. I mean, it, there, there really is no guidance at all. The Supreme Court has given us no guidance whatsoever, but it's very subjective and say, gee whiz. Uh, I, I was I was concerned uh, I was concerned for my safety and the safety of others. Now, in this narrative that Wilson gave, remember the thing about his waistband as he was charging the police officer. He had his hand in his waistband. Now, what in the hell was that about? Or even think about the Looney Tunes reference that Darren Wilson, rather than Michael Brown, ran so fast that he kicks up dust behind him while wearing shorts and flip flops. As you pointed out again, what the police do is they try to create a narrative of threat, of fear, and of violence, and they'll bend the facts, they'll lie, and they'll obfuscate. And that's clearly what Darren Wilson did here. Another interesting fact that apparently has been left out of the mainstream media is that they said that Darren Wilson was in imminent threat of his life from somebody 20 or 30 feet away. Now we find out the struggle was about 150 feet away from the car. So Darren Wilson was not in any sense of imminent threat, but what you can do is, as we saw with Eric Gardner, as we've now seen with the poor child in Cleveland who's 12 years old, shot on video by a cop because he was playing with a toy gun in a park, is that you create fantastical stories. And then you play on bias. And then, as you pointed out again, George Zimmerman did the same thing, coming up with this fictive story about this feral black youth armed with iced tea and Skittles who then can attack and kill him, and he's in, quote, unquote, imminent fear of his life. And that Okay, now let me, let me again, I, I, I keep coming back to this point because you can take virtually any police report from any part of the country, and you could superimpose it, lay it right down on top of here, and you're going to have the same elements. As you point out, here was this, as they want to describe this huge black beast is what they're trying to say, this this feral black beast that we had to be afraid of. That You always see that in the report. You know, this it's always big, it's always threatening. And then the second part of it then becomes, he was making some motion or something that led me to believe objectively, or at least sub subjectively, that, that, that he was going to do something bad. Now, those two things always come into play, and that's why I come to the waistband idea. Do you remember the report as you're reading Darren Wilson He's talking about that, that that Brown was actually charging him, charging at him, 
as bullets were flying at him and that 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 Brown had his hand in his waistband. That is the magic. You see, that those are the magic words. Those are the magic words that says everything's okay. We can move on. Is that the way you saw this, or did I miss something here? I, I absolutely agree. So the waistband is a signal to the jurors that this person, of course, because we know all black people are armed. We know all black men are giant feral beasts who carry weapons, be it guns, knives, razors, or any other variety of weapon. And again, as you said, it's a blueprint. So you signal to the juror, look, this crazed black person is attacking me like the Incredible Hulk. And apparently Michael Brown, according to Darren Wilson, was also demonically possessed. Yeah, talk about that, because we see that in, re we see that in reports a lot. Drug influence, those types. So talk about that, Get about 40 seconds. Talk about that. Yeah, the demon part is very important because, again, that suggests that black folks are some type of superhuman other that need no empathy, that deserve no respect, and are not citizens. And that goes back to the lynching discourse in the late 19th and early 20th century, where routinely in newspapers, African Americans who were victims of lynching violence would be described as demonic fiends or imps of the inferno. So no, those were actual words that you would see in those reports. Oh, absolutely. They would say, imps of the inferno. Um, and the other thing that you would see in this profoundly racist discourse from lynching newspapers is that the, the killers are described as noble men who are just doing their job, which is basically what Darren Wilson said to ABC when he said, I have no regrets. I did the right thing. Yeah, the important thing about the Darren Wilson story is it con continues to emerge, and as we read it closer and closer, it is almost exactly like you would find in any police report where there's a homicide that's taken place. Chauncey DeVega, thanks for following this story. We'll do, uh, we'll do some follow-up as Darren Wilson rehabilitates himself in the media, okay? Absolutely. Thanks a lot. The prosecuting attorney in the Darren Wilson grand jury could have easily brought an indictment against Wilson for killing Michael Brown. There was no question about that. But the system is so rigged that it's nearly impossible to indict a police officer in this country. I have Karen Evans with me now to explain why that's happening. Karen, it's becoming more and more apparent uh, just how difficult it is to, to actually prosecute a police officer when they commit homicide. The numbers are staggering. I, the Nation uh, did, a, did a great article on this. Uh, I was hoping you could talk about just how difficult it is and why has it become so difficult to get a homicide conviction off of, from a police officer who, 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 who simply is poorly trained, overly aggressive, and uses bad judgment. Absolutely. Um, I, I think it's a combination of, of, a, of a couple of factors, Mike, uh, that lead to the difficulty in prosecuting police officers who've committed, in my opinion, criminal acts. I think the FBI tallied 461 justifiable, and I'm using air quotes for justifiable homicides, in uh, 2013. This is the highest number in 20 years. And I think the reason why there's so many, uh, there's this improbable, improbability of getting a conviction is, is one, I think the standard. The standard is just uh, basically it's like an invitation to murder. Uh, you know, the, the, the well, let's talk. Let's talk about that. That standard. There was an evolution of cases that came out of the, the, the appellate courts and the Supreme Court. Supreme Court looked at it and they said, look, we have to come up with some stability. We need to come up with a standard that's going to tell us when does a police officer become responsible for for needlessly killing someone? And what what did that standard develop into? Well, the standard is is whether the officer has probable cause to believe that the suspect poses a significant threat of death or harm, a physical harm to the officer. But in reality, what that actually means is that uh, it, it basically is like a green light. If the officer fears for his safety, then he can shoot and kill. And, you know, it, and, and to look at if American history, we know that the African-American male is viewed as a threat. Uh, you know, it's it's in every day, every day you turn on the TV, you see African-American males presented in a way where they're demonized, they, they are they are presented in such a way that, that they think it's a threat. As for this officer, Darren Wilson, I have no doubt in my mind that he really thought that this man was a, a threat to him. He really thought that Michael Brown was a threat to him. And he, I think Darren Davis, Darren Wilson forgot that he himself was over, what, 6'4", he was 6'6". He's a big hulking man. And yet he, he described uh, Michael Brown as being someone he said he felt like he was a five-year-old. That's just panic. That just shows that well, he, just, uh, he, just, he just lost control and he wasn't properly trained. 
Well, Karen, isn't that part of it? I mean, when the Supreme Court looks at these, the appellate courts look at these cases, there'll always be some discussion. Even though they always side with the police officers, there'll always be some discussion of, gee whiz, uh, you know, maybe we need better training. Gee whiz, maybe we need better, uh, better standards for even allowing a, man to be, a person to become a police officer. Maybe we ought to have MMPI tests to find out whether, A, they may just be too fearful for the job. B, they may be overly aggressive and shouldn't have a gun in their hand. Or C, they simply don't have the competence or the, the intellect to be a police officer. So you see this dicta, this discussion come up in all of these Supreme Court or all these appellate cases in some form or fashion. But they always end up by saying that, you know what, we're going to give a standard called objective reasonableness. Now, what in the hell is objective reasonableness? What, what, what does that mean? Doesn't it mean just, just objectively you can do whatever you want to do? I, it shouldn't mean that objective should mean what a reasonable police officer would do under these same or similar circumstances. And the problem, though, with the Supreme Court decisions is that they don't allow for retrospective analysis of of the uh, of the officer's conduct. They they give great wef, uh, weight and deference to the officer, such that pretty much anything the officer says uh, empowers them to use deadly force when they think it's it's appropriate. But the problem is that the officer's perception of danger is strongly influenced by bias. And, and this is the issue, and, and in the Michael Brown situation, uh, situation, the influence of bias is the racial component. In America, we have a problem with race, and we don't want to deal with it. But if we don't deal with it, we're going to continue to have uh, instances like this where it's going to be open season on black males. I've had so many discussions well, you know, with we, my we keep, friends we, about we, we this. Talk, we, we talk about Michael Brown, but again, the, the, the numbers are staggering. The numbers of, of, of police homicides are staggering, especially um, especially where it comes to black Americans. 96, this is just the FBI database. And, and by the way, they, they choose not to have a very good database because they're worried about the impact of this. But out of out, out about 96 police homicides a year where a white officer is killing a black man. And so th there obviously is some there's some uh, uh, non-starter there where it comes to hiring to begin with. That's where this always comes back to, you know, who are we hiring? How are they being trained? Are we doing a personal profile on them? There are all kinds of tests, as you're aware of. They use them in hospitals, don't they? They use them when they hire nurses. They use them when they hire employees that take care of people. We can do something. But we don't. Now, let me ask you this. The Nation magazine did a great, uh, a great job handling this myth. Mm -hmm. And the myth is that there's some there's there's going to be an investigation of these police officers after they commit these kinds of horrendous acts. Tell us what a myth that is and, and how meaningless that really is. Because it really is not an investigation. It's it's more like the fox guarding the hen house. I mean, there there is there there really is no. It's not what you see on TV. You know, it, it's not this stringent investigation. It's merely more whitewashing uh, of 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 the officer's conduct. So to me, I mean, what we need this this is a broader problem than just uh, than than just an issue of, of lack of training. This goes back to the influence of bias in the administration of judge of of, of justice in America. And if we truly want to prevent uh, needless killings of of all people, but it's particularly we, we talk about African American males. But if we want to stop that, then we've got to do uh, we've got to we've got to look at a lot of social issues in this country because the response in Ferguson to to this shooting, the, the criminalization, the demilitarization of the police officers. I mean, when you look at these ins these photos, it looks like we're in a foreign country. It looks like we could be in Iraq. It could look like they are preparing to fight ISIS. Karen, you, you work with Johnny Cochran Law Firm in Washington, D.C., and Johnny Cochran, of course, was the person that always took on these cases in civil court. In other words, police officer kills a man, all right? Court does nothing about it. The investigation is done by, uh, you know, there's no investigation by the police officers of the police officers. They don't do anything. So what Cochran would do is bring civil actions against those police departments. Tell me, really, 
What is the net result of that, in your opinion, having watched all that? It, does it really change anything? Not really, because the police officers, the ones who are committing these heinous crimes, in my view, are not the ones who are actually paying out on, the, on any kind of settlement or, or in, in the courts. And so there's no accountability attached to the actions. What we need is, is better training of officers. As you've, imp, uh, if you've implied, we need uh, some sort of personality test to see who's fit to be an officer. Uh, to be a police officer, I remember a time when police officers were friends. They were thought of as being uh, someone in the community that you could go to in a time of need. That has changed, and we need to go back to the days when police officers were really uh, an aid to citizens. Instead, now uh, they're more like uh, they're, they're like an army against poor citizens, particularly. Well, do you agree others. that? Do you agree? A lot of commentators say that won't happen until there's some prosecutions of some of these police. That's uh, in right. In your experience, having done this for so long, do you agree with that? That's absolutely right. What we need are is the ability to sue the police officer individually and as an employee of these de uh, the, these departments, and to hold the police officer personally accountable, so that he's going to feel the pain that that families feel when police police officers go rogue. I want to talk about, you know, I, I, read a, I read a poem, and I think we've all read the poem uh, by Langston Hughes, What Happens to a Dream Deferred, and it seems apt in this situation because so many people want to know why is it that the citizens of uh, Ferguson are burning down their own neighborhood, and I think this poem sums it up. It says, uh, what happens to a dream that's deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust over and sugar over like a syrupy s sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or just explode. And I think that's the answer to why we have the violence in response to the actions uh, of not n indicting this criminal, uh, this officer Darren Wilson in Ferguson. Man, it'll always be like that until we start taking more, more, more serious action. Karen Evans, thank you for joining me, okay? Thank you. Movements are taking place all over the country to raise the minimum wage for American workers. And while they're gaining momentum, corporations are still finding ways to cheat workers out of an honest day's pay. I have Michael Berg with me to explain how that's happening. Michael, your law firm has done an incredible, uh, an incredible job taking care of workers that have been the, the, the subject of wage theft. Most people don't even know what wage theft is. They just go to work every day. They assume that the employer is going to play right. Uh, they assume that they're going to play by the rules. And in the end, these people just have uh, huge amounts of money stolen from them in different kinds of ways. Talk about this a little bit. How, well, how do you see the problem, first of all? Well, first of all, the problem is bigger than most people realize. Ninety-five percent of today's workers have some form of wage theft going on. And, and, that, and, 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 and it's actually huge in terms of either they don't pay them the right amount, they don't pay them overtime. Uh, we've had some class actions, as has your firm, in which we go after wage and hour, where they're not paying them for the, you know, they're not paying for overtime, they're not giving them the proper amount of time off work. Uh, the time preparing uh, in the fast food industry. So, so it, it's a huge problem uh, that, that people don't understand that even if you wage, raise the minimum wage, which a number of states have done, and we can talk more about that, you still have this problem of wage theft. Well, we started seeing it early on. I, I think the first real wage theft, wage theft kind of stories that I started seeing, Mike, was where they would tell an employee, go ahead and clock out, and oh, by the way, there's about 30 minutes worth of more work here, and would you go ahead and work another 30 minutes? And when you do the numbers on it, um, and the numbers are staggering, because this means that the, the, uh, the average worker, and this is a, a staggering number, but the average worker who is subject to this kind of wage theft loses $1,400 a year in those types of things. Now, that's enough to pay for, I mean, if you're, if you're a minimum wage worker and you're basically just barely making rent payments or utility payments, you're, 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 you're hit for a lot of money there. It's, it's between 10 and 15 percent. And it starts at the lowest levels. The, the undocumented workers, we already know that they get hit. 
because they don't get paid what they're supposed to. They don't, they don't even get paid minimum wage. And then it moves up to the fast food workers. Exactly what you're talking about, they say check out, but then they still have to close it down. They have to clean the grill, they have to do all those things. They don't pay them for that. And they also, we see it in, in other industries where the setup time, they don't want them to, they want them to set up before they clock in. In essence, they're stealing hours and stealing money from these people. And, and even in the states, you've seen a lot of red states this last election, uh, Nebraska, uh, South Dakota, uh, Arkansas, where they raised the minimum wage. And while that may help a little bit, it doesn't stop the wage theft. Mike, I saw a number one time, tell me if this is in the ballpark, that it was between 40 and $50 billion a year that corporations take from the average worker uh, in wage theft. Is that a number that, that has been your experience? It is. It, it, and when people real, realize the, the actual amount that is being stolen from the average worker, it goes back to the things we've talked about on this show many times, which is how do you get this worker, how do you protect that worker? Even when we bring class actions, even when our law firms go there, that's not enough because 51% of the people who are being having their wages stolen are afraid to even say anything because they're afraid of retaliation. They're afraid of losing their job. They're afraid of ba basically having, the, you know, being put out on the streets or, or being a troublemaker. And, and it goes back to what they've done to the unions in this country because the unions should be the first line of defense to stop this kind of wage theft. But, but as you, as we know, and we've talked about, the unions have been basically destroyed in America. Well, you did a story one time, I recall, and you said this is where the this is where employers want to go. Employers want to go to where there's right now there's nine million people out of work. OK, uh, I think three million have been out of work for more than six months. I mean, it's that serious. So what ends up happening is that's a perfect environment for an employer because you have 10 people in line to line up for that greeter position at Walmart. So the greeter once the greeter experiences wage theft, hell, they're not going to do anything about it. They're not going to complain about it. They're going to be silent about it. They're going to put up with it simply because they realize there's nine people behind them that want that job. Now, how are people dealing, how are communities dealing, or are they dealing with, with wage theft by organizing anything that, that deals with it in a structure? Well, 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 some places they have. In Seattle, for example, where they raise the minimum wage, they do have the, the without NELP, N-E-L-P, which is basically an enforcement division. Even, even these states where you raise the, the, the wages doesn't help unless you have enforcement, unless you have some teeth. We see that in all the areas we talk about, but somebody must be uh, looking at and enforcing to make sure the wage theft doesn't, doesn't exist. But we only have it in, in a few areas and only in a few places. So, so throughout most of the country, there is no enforcement, even when the wages have been raised. So, so now we're in a situation, as you pointed out, that there, the American public realizes that, that people can't live on $7 an hour. They've got to have a minimum wage that means something. So you have them coming up. You have communities and states coming up with, with uh, like, as you point out, Alaska, Arkansas, Nebraska, South Dakota. They're coming up with, uh, with what, what they call seal, uh, uh, floors, and they say, look, $15 an hour allows a person to live. Not only that, it allows that person to invest in the community. They can go out and they can buy a television, they can buy a new car, uh, they, they, can, they can pay for food at the local grocer, and so it's good for our community. But without a, without a serious enforcement, there's really nothing that happens, that, which leads me to, to you, your law firm. With class actions in the past, a class action has allowed you at least to, to go after a corporation. Maybe it's a Walmart. Oh, you know, I think both of our firms handled a, one of the biggest Walmart cases in, in the country. But the only way we could get to Walmart was to take discovery, to have people sitting on the other side of a table beating the hell out of them to get to the truth. And in the end, Walmart says, okay, we give, 
we're we're going to we're going to have to comply. It, do you see any other way to get to them? Because I mean, you, the U.S. Well, government's not doing anything to enforce well, this. Well, that, that, that's the key. If you go to Denmark, Denmark they have a minimum wage of twenty dollars an hour. It doesn't hurt their economy, like the people here keep saying it's going to hurt the economy. But here's the best part: their enforcement. If they have a fast food company that's doing wage theft, they shut down. All of the Burger Kings or all the McDonald's or all of the fast food chain. And you can't operate your business until you make sure that you're complying. That's the kind of teeth we need, but we're never going to get it here in this country because, as we know, these giant corporations are running everything. So all we can do is have people come forward and then we try to protect them. And that takes a long time, as, as we know in the Walmart case. It took years and years and years and years. And you and I both know they're probably going back and doing the same thing or trying to figure a new way in which they're doing wage theft. So while we catch them uh, and they pay money to the people who, who they've damaged, they that morph into mean, something else. Exactly. Yeah. They figure My, a new Michael, way. Michael, how, how do you see the Supreme Court? Real, we got about 30 seconds. How do you see the Supreme Court helping? To, to make this any any better for the worker. I, I mean, I can't I, even imagine anything more I, outrageous. I, this Supreme Court has been, and their, their rulings have been more in favor of corporations than any other Supreme Court in the history of the United States. So I see very little chance that they're going to step up and help the workers. The workers themselves have been organized, and they have to speak out so people like you and I can help them by, by bringing in action in court. Well, and, 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 and at the end of the day, I guess the best we can hope for is to, to, to be able to take them on in a civil case, hit them the only place they care about, that's the pocketbook, and hope, hope that that makes any difference. And, and I know you're out there doing that. Thank goodness you are that we have law firms doing that throughout the country because it is the only recourse. Uh, Michael Berg, thank you for joining me. As usual, it's a topic corporate media is not talking about. I'm glad we have the opportunity to talk about it. Thank you, Mike. That's it for this week's Ring of Fire, but you can keep up with this throughout the week online at ringoffireradio.com or at Twitter at Ring of Fire Radio and on Facebook. I'm Mike Papantonio, and we'll see you next week right here on Ring of Fire.